Hi, you are in the ladies' room with Dr. Danica, the only public ladies' room you can enter any time without ever waiting online. I'm your host, Dr. Danica Moore. We'll be having real conversations with real women about really intimate issues. They may be embarrassing, sad, or funny, but they will always be interesting and informative. You know, like the best conversations you've had in ladies' rooms with your best friends or total strangers and a physician. Please join us. Hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of In the Ladies' Room with Dr. Danica. Today, we are talking about the big O. But before you get too excited, let me tell you that O stands for osteoarthritis, which is a very common joint disease that most often affects athletes as well as middle-aged to elderly people. But stay tuned to the end because this is one condition where sexual activity may be part of the treatment. So how fun is that? Uh, also, according to the National Institutes of Health, osteoarthritis affects about 27 million Americans over age 25. So if you or someone you care about doesn't already have OA, chances are it will come up in your conversations soon. Because of our aging population and because of the growing size of our population, literally our expanding weight as individuals, it's estimated that by 2030, approximately one in five Americans will be at high risk for developing osteoarthritis or OA. Now it's commonly referred to as the quote unquote wear and tear form of arthritis, but it's a disease that affects the cartilage, joints, joint lining, ligaments, and bone. My guest today, Dr. Alexis Colvin, is uniquely qualified to discuss this. She's an associate professor of sports medicine at the Mount Sinai Hospital Department of Orthopedic Surgery, and you may not know many women who are orthopedic surgeons. That's because even though about 50% of graduating medical students now are female, only about 4.6% of practicing orthopedic surgeons are women. So she also serves as the Chief Medical Officer of the United States Tennis Association and cares for elite tennis players during the U.S. Open and is also the medical advisor to the U.S. Fed Cup team. She's also served as a physician at the U.S. Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, Colorado. So she's busy. Dr. Colvin graduated from Princeton University, yay, my alma mater, and the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. She completed her orthopedic surgery residency at the New York University Hospital for Joint Diseases, after which she underwent additional training in sports medicine at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, where she cared for professional athletes from the Pittsburgh Steelers, Pittsburgh Penguins, and collegiate athletes at the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University, amongst others. She's received numerous awards for her work, uh, including being chosen by the Arthritis Foundation for their 2012 Women on the Move Award, which honors extraordinary women who are balancing family life, careers, and community involvement. So I'm guessing you're a little tired, huh? Oh, caffeine, caffeine does wonders, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's my plug for my drug of choice, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, which I'm eventually going to kick the habit, but not today because caffeine does <laughs> wonders. Now, speaking of how tired you are, what I did not put in the introduction is anything about your personal life which is how we actually met. Uh, we met on yeah. social media when you posted on a Princeton University alumni listserv looking for a part-time babysitter because you have how many children? Three kids. And they're how old? They are five, eight, and nine. Wow, so did you find a babysitter? We, we actually have an au pair, which would, that could be a whole separate um, yeah. podcast, um, but actually it's been great. He's actually a physical therapist, ironically. Oh, um, even better. Yeah, and he's our first bro pair, so it's a guy, actually. Oh, um, okay. So, but it's actually, it's actually working really well. Man, uh, man-sitter. <laughs> man-sitter, Manny, yeah. <laughs> Manny. My son came home from school one day when he was about in fifth grade, and we had always had women uh, babysitters up until that point. And he was not a confrontational kid, but he just stomped his foot and he said, I want a man babysitter. <laughs> <laughs> and we found a fabulous high school student who became not only a Manny, but also yeah, a wonderful mentor. Uh, but yeah, I, they are hard to find, though. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't done a separate podcast on childcare, which is actually a great topic. Uh, but I do try to weave it into all of our conversations with working mothers because that's yeah. what we do. It work, we work it in and we weave it into the fabric of our lives. Uh, I think. Yeah most common questions that our listeners have for our women physician guests 
is how did you decide to become the type of physician you became? How, what drew you to orthopedic surgery? Um, you know, it, I will spare you the details of the most boring part of the story, but um, <laughs> when I actually did the rotations, um, there's just something very satisfying about using your hands to make somebody's knee better, their shoulder better. You know, you can see the results from, you know, the patient can't walk or they can't lift their arm, and then you are the one that's actually fixing those things back together, and then they come back to see you in the office, and, and you know, now they can go back to the activities they want to do. So um, I really liked that hands-on approach and being able to fix it. Um, and, you know, it, it, no matter what level of activity they are, whether it's, you know, just daily recreational stuff or higher level things, there's, there's definitely some, you know, amount of um, satisfaction from being able to see people get back to what they love doing. And you subspecialized in sports medicine. So were you a competitive athlete before medical school? Uh, I would say recreational, not, not enough to get into college. So I had, I had to use my brain. <laughs> <laughs> I hate when that happens. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was, I was actually a competitive swimmer and I did, was a varsity oh. in college. Uh, but I remember being devastated when I met with the Princeton coach before, you know, the, uh, applications were, you know, due. And he, yeah. said, he said, you're just not fast enough for me to put you on my list, you know, to be a recruited swimmer. Uh, he said, yeah. but I think you'll get in anyway. And I thought he was just saying that to be nice. So I did appreciate it. Yeah. What he also said is that Princeton's philosophy was anybody who was willing to get up at five in the morning and do two a day practices was welcome to be a walk on onto the varsity swim team. So Yeah. And I, these these days you don't even actually have to do the sport in some other colleges. You can just <laughs> Photoshop your face. Well, that's a thanks to Photoshop, uh, but that's a whole, we didn't have that in my day. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we also didn't have as complicated or recruited athlete uh, process in my day. Uh, we also had relatively few women at Princeton in my day. Yes. So yeah. Thing that has changed. Uh, I actually thought I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon when I entered college. Um, because mm -hmm. I was, you know, not just because I was a competitive athlete, but because I had a long history of being an orthopedic patient. Uh, I had yeah. scoliosis and had a lot of surgeries. Um, but when I realized the length of the surgeries and the grueling nature of that, <laughs> I kind of switched for another, a number of other reasons to OBGYN. Uh, so at what point- It's also pretty long too, though. Uh, yeah, but I didn't do oncology. So I never had a 12 hour OBGYN surgery, which was pretty common in orthopedics. I remember in my rotation in medical school, I did work with my, one of my own spinal surgeons and oh, wow. just the whole idea. Uh, and since this podcast is called in the ladies room, we'll, we'll share this. Uh, the yeah. whole idea of not being able to go to the bathroom for 12 hours just totally overwhelmed me. So how do you deal yeah, with yeah. long surgical procedures? You know, another thing too is I, you know, I, I operated pretty much up until the end with all three kids also. Um, and so, you know, that, that actually that pregnancy stomach actually came in handy because I could balance things on there. Um, so, <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. I don't think it, I think you just get used to it. To, to be honest, to be fair, I, I really don't have any 12 hour surgeries. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think you just get used to it. Okay, so speaking of the ladies' room, what is your yeah. most unique, different, or m most memorable experience that you've ever personally had in a ladies' room aside from this interview? You know, I'm going to tell you the point that you brought, brought up in the beginning about very few um, women in medicine actually go into orthopedics. That actually is most helpful when you're at an orthopedic conference because there's pretty much no one in the bathroom. <laughs> um, <laughs> And there's never a line. So I never see any other women there. <laughs> that is a great point. I actually was at the American College of OBGYNs convention uh, when I was very pregnant and my son was breached. So he was constantly kicking my bladder. And yeah. there was a huge long line for the ladies room. And I actually asked several women physicians if I could cut the line. And I was very pregnant. And they, yeah. all turned, me, they turned me down. They would not let me Wow. Cut. So you know, of course, what I did, which was use the men's room. <laughs> now, did you have, when you were in residency, 
did you have a women physicians locker room or did you share the locker room with the men physicians? No, oh my gosh. Um, yeah, de definitely, definitely we had um, our own locker room because there's also, you know, the nurses and surgical technicians and that kind of stuff that, that need a place too. Right. So when um, I was president, the male physicians had their own locker room, but the women physicians shared the lock had work had shared the locker room with the nurses. Oh my goodness. So when people ask me what I think is the most unrealistic thing about doctor television shows like Grey's Anatomy is did you yeah. know they all the the male and female doc residents are sharing the same locker room and they're all changing. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, in my experience that's not what happened in real life. So tell us how you got interested in tennis and how did, how did that happen, becoming a chief medical officer for the uh, USTA? Yeah, you know, I've worked at the US Open. This is going to be my 11th year working there. Um, and, you know, it's just one of those, I wish there was a great story, but it really was, um, uh, you know, somebody knew I was doing sports medicine in my group, actually, um, and knew that there was an opening uh, in terms of needing um, an additional staff member at the um, at the open. And so it really was one of those things where I sort of just worked my way up. Um, you know, I really have to tell you, it's probably one of the most rewarding things I do because I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of other sports, professional and Olympic level. The one thing that's really unique about tennis is that, um, you know, the women really um, have fought to have equal pay, equal participation. You know, a lot of the, the female tennis players are um, as well known as the men or even better. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at, you know, any other sport, it's not just not the same in terms of either professional women's basketball or soccer or anything like that. So it's really nice to be in a sport where um, the women are so um, strong and powerful. So I will tell you, I have a, a USTA story. Uh, I used to play tennis in high school um, on the New York City uh, Junior uh, Public Tennis League, whatever it was called. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, the first year that the USTA allowed uh, girls to be ball girl or ball boys, oh I wow, be a ball girl, uh, and that was when the U.S. Open was at Forest Hills. Uh, so it was many, many years ago. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that was a very, very cool experience. Uh, Do you have any memorable matches? Uh, yes, I was the ball girl for Roscoe Tanner, and I don't remember who he was. I was so charmed by him, who he was true. Yeah. I don't remember which bad boy of tennis he was playing. I want to uh -huh. say it might have been Nastasi. Uh, but he was just so charming. And every time I threw him the ball, he said, thank you. And it mm -hmm. was, that was my first match. And it was, you know, phenomenal. It was really phenomenal. But I'll tell you another story uh, that you'll appreciate. Um, as a surgeon, when I was recuperating from my first spinal surgery, I went up to my tennis courts and I was forlornly just looking at the courts and I wanted to play, I wanted to hit, but I was in a full body cast and I was only four weeks post-op and my surgeon, when I asked him if I, you know, when I could go back to playing tennis, he laughed and he said, you could do whatever you feel up to. It never occurred to him. Um, it never occurred to him that I would want to play tennis. So yeah. I was looking at the tennis courts and lo and behold, I feel like sometimes I feel like Forrest Gump because I always have a story like this. I was yeah. only 17 years old, standing there watching my friends play and I had nobody to hit with. And along comes a, a camera crew uh, from Sports Illustrated. And I get talking to the camera guy and I say, you know, he asked me what happened to me. I was in a 35 pound body cast and what happened to me and why I'm there. And I tell him, I just, I need somebody to hit with, but I can't run. And I just uh -huh. need you can hit the ball to me. And he starts laughing and he said, uh, oh, I have the perfect person for you. And turns out they're doing a photo shoot with Bjorn Borg. Oh my and gosh. Bjorn Borg comes along and they just need pictures of him looking like he's hitting the ball. They didn't uh -huh. need pictures of who he was hitting the ball to. They were planning to just have him hit the ball to nobody. And uh -huh. so it actually was perfect because he was able to perfectly hit the ball to me to yeah. my forehand a hundred percent of the time. And then I just yeah. you know easily lob it back. So and That's I really funny. co-authored a book on tennis. 
And t- and put- yeah, you know, it, it focuses a lot on actually the younger tennis athletes, mm-hmm. um, the, the juniors and the kids, because so much of um, the injuries and um, things that happen, just, just, they, they just really just need education. And, and so a lot of the pros and at the higher levels, they have the information, but with the juniors and the younger kids, a lot of times that information is just not there. Um, and so we really want to try to clear up um, the misconceptions and, and give kind of everybody, not just the physician, but also the physical therapist um, and coaches, just everyone who's involved. And in, because, um, you know, as you know, it really takes a team uh, around a tennis player to really have the knowledge to help, um, help that young person achieve their goals. Absolutely. And that's really a team approach is great with every kind of illness. So let's switch yeah. gears now and shift from the young tennis player to the yeah. middle-aged, you know, maybe weekend warrior, uh, you know, people who have left, whose sports glory days are years and years behind them. Talk about osteoarthritis, what people's symptoms are, how they come to know they have it, uh, and then we'll get into things like prevention and treatment. Okay, so osteoarthritis is wearing down of the coating cartilage at the end of our bones. So the, the, the way to think about it is, um, and hopefully there's, you know, even if you're a vegetarian, you can picture this. Um, but if you have the end of a chicken drum, you have this shiny white surface at the end, which is the coating cartilage. And so normally that's like a nice thick layer of paint on the inside of our joints and everything moves smoothly without a problem. But when you have arthritis, what happens is that smooth surface actually will start to get cracks in it, the little potholes in it. And then it becomes painful because now you have two rough surfaces rubbing against each other. Um, and, you know, it, it you know, it doesn't happen overnight. It, it can actually happen from an injury. Um, you can, you know, you could be, you know, younger and just do something where you think you just tweaked a knee, um, but you may have, you know, could have knocked off a piece of cartilage. Um, so it could be something that stemmed from something when you were younger. Um, but in general, most of what you feel is just discomfort that is very gradual in nature. Okay. And so when we're talking about that bone on, you know, people are talk- when the wearing down on the cartilage, people ex- describe that as the bone on bone, you know, sort of yeah. rubbing against each other. Can, can cartilage be replaced or regenerated? That is um, a good question. That's where a lot of the scientific research is going right now, because right now we don't have a gold standard for filling in the cartilage anymore or, or at this time. So there's a lot of different surgeries for it. So there's things where you take someone's cartilage and then bring it to the lab to grow, or you can take um, donor cartilage from a, do- from a cadaver from a donor. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways um, because we don't have the perfect solution right now. So that's why um, there's still so many people ending up with knee replacement, hip replacement, sort of the end, the end um, treatment for, for arthritis. So who's most at risk for this? You know, you touched on a really good point in terms of the weight. Um, that, that certainly um, has a relationship with, um, I would say for sure, pain from arthritis, especially in, in knees and hips. Um, so um, I would say people who are overweight, people who do a lot of um, impact activity could potentially be at risk for it. Um, or um, someone who's had a bad injury in the past that at that time maybe there didn't really just seem to be anything that needed surgery. But again, like I said, maybe they, they injured a cartilage or, or something like that uh, at that time. And then over time, it doesn't, does not heal itself. And so then it can become a bigger problem. Yeah, we do hear a lot about former elite gymnasts who wind up getting, mm-hmm. you know, talked about getting osteoarthritis as, as early as 35 uh, to 40. But why are women at so much higher risk for osteoarthritis? You know, I don't know exactly if there's a, um, you know, biological reason necessarily. Um, there are other types of arthritis. So the word arthritis just means wearing down of the coating cartilage, but there's a lot of different paths to get to that particular problem. So osteoarthritis, the one we're talking about, is sort of the one that typically happens with aging. But there's, um, you know, a whole other group of um, arthritis issues that uh, fall under the heading of rheumatology. And so there's rheumatoid arthritis where the body, it's like an autoimmune issue where the body's attacking itself. And women are more likely to get um, those, those forms of arthritis. Yeah. Or arthritis. Uh, so maybe osteoarthritis is just more common in women because women are more likely to live longer. Live longer. And, yeah. Or to be more overweight. Younger. 
<laughs> yeah. We'll have more wear and tear on our bodies. And more our- wear. <laughs> Um, but you mentioned a good point. We've, we've talked about rheumatoid arthritis on this podcast in the past with a patient uh, and a physician uh, together. Um, and so, and she was, that physician was a rheumatologist. So mm-hmm. somebody is having joint pain, who do they normally see first? Or what would you recommend that they normally see first? I think it depends on what led up to the joint pain. So if it's an accident or they, you know, they were playing a sport or something like that, where there's a distinct moment. Um, that typically I would have them recommend seeing an orthopedist. Um, if it's something where it's um, kind of came out of nowhere, there's a lot of swelling. Um, a lot of times, it, a lot of times with the uh, rheumatoid issues, it's both uh, sides, so both left and right, um, like both hands, both feet, both knees. If that's the case, it may be worth seeing the rheumatologist first, so they can make sure it's nothing else. Yeah, I think that's one of the most common questions we get from people who listen to our podcast also is, who do I see for X condition? Yeah. You know, what type of doctor? Uh, my usual answer is see your primary care physician first. Yeah, yeah. You know, so hopefully they will be able to help you navigate and help do the original screening tests. Um, because our initial treatment for osteoarthritis is what? You know, first level. So usually yeah, exercise, physical therapy. Weight loss, but it's hard to it's hard to work out if your if your knees hurt. Um, and then you know the usual Advil, leave over the counter medications if you need it, but also ice or heat. Um, sometimes it helps to wear like a soft knee brace. Um, and so those things, yes, you could certainly see your primary care doctor, and they could recommend those for you. Okay, so a lot of people are confused about uh, over the counter non steroidal anti inflammatory medicines like the ibuprofen, you know, Motrin, Advil, same thing, Aleve. Um, and the, their role, not only in treating the pain, but actually in helping the condition. So you, can, you, can you speak to that in terms of inflammation um, and reducing inflammation yep. and just like biting the bullet and dealing with the pain? <laughs> yeah. So the medication itself, Advil, Aleve, Motrin, those things, they're not going to necessarily, they're not going to put the cartilage back. And that's really the way to think about arthritis is that it's, a structural problem. So I like to use the analogy, if you think of a road that has the asphalt on there versus a road that has a lot of little potholes, that's what happens with arthritis is that you start developing little potholes. And so with the medication, you're not going to fix that, um, but it can help with the discomfort from there. So um, either from the swelling um, or just, you know, stiffness, um, sort of the, the consequences of having the arthritis. But if you feel like you don't really have much discomfort, you don't necessarily need to take it. Or if the discomfort is not consistent, sometimes, you know, um, people don't really feel like they need to take the medication. Okay. And of course, we know that over 100,000 Americans per year get gastrointestinal bleeding, uh, requiring hospitalization from the consequences and side effects of taking this, these medicines. So, of course, there's always yeah. a downside. Uh, people always ask me about the role of diet and supplements in any condition. And of course, in osteoarthritis, there's a lot of buzz on the internet of misinformation uh, about yeah. shark cartilage and other dietary supplements that are being hawked for the treatment of osteoarthritis. What do you think about those and what's their role? Um, you're right. They do a really good job of marketing. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, the analogy I like to use is, if you were a man who was going bald and I gave you some hair pills to eat, it's not going to grow the hair back on your head. Um, so that's the same thing with, you know, with the cartilage, it's not, it's not going to grow the cartilage back into your um, knees or joints, wherever you need it. There's been, I would say there's been some very, very anecdotal evidence that um, people find pain relief. That's a key word, pain relief, not replacing the cartilage um, with um, glucosamine and chondroitin. However, the actual like, evidence-based studies, um, you know, they're pretty limited because they're either sponsored by the drug company or you, know, you just um, can't necessarily, there's so many other factors that you don't take into account that could also be the reason for why people feel better. Then. So um, uh, the, other, the other point too is that you know, those supplements are not regulated in the same way Tylenol or Advil are. And so um, you, know, you really have to sort of do your research in terms of the purity of the uh, supplement that you're getting. Yeah, or the way that prescription drugs are available. Uh, now, talk to yeah. us a little bit about Visco supplements, which are not, you know, over-the-counter supplements, but they are actually yeah. injectables. 
So explain what those are, yeah. what your criteria would be for using those. Yeah, so the, the injection, the other, the other word that's sometimes used for it is hyaluronic acid. Um, and there's a lot of trade names for it as well. And so the idea is that it's, a, it's you know, the way they market it is that it's, okay, it's, it's going to, you know, cushion inside the knees. But it really doesn't. It probably um, doesn't necessarily physically stay in the knee joint for very long. However, it can help with discomfort from arthritis. So, again, it's not putting the cartilage back, which is probably what you really need, but it can help with the discomfort. Um, you know, same thing, the, the evidence on it has been, in terms of whether it works, has been um, a little, you know, I would say, you can I find things to argue both sides of the coin in terms of using it. But, you know, a lot of people do find that it helps with their discomfort and it, and it can potentially help delay um, needing a knee replacement. So, and there's just pretty, there's very little downside to, to using it. So, um, uh, it is certainly worth a thing, uh, worth trying it as well if your doctor thinks it's, it's reasonable. And about how long does the pain relief last from one of the injections of one of those hyaluronic acids? Um, you know, it's very slow to kick in. I would say it usually takes about a month or so to kick in. And then I would say on average, probably around six months. I've had a few people that go, a year, um, and then some people that don't feel like it did anything at all. So it's pretty, it's pretty variable in terms of um, how much how much relief people get. And of course, we don't have any uh, crystal ball or diagnostic test to determine in advance who's gonna who would benefit from this versus who would. Yeah, I would say some, sometimes I see people with really really bad arthritis and they just don't want surgery, and we try it and they do find relief. Um, and then on the flip side, people who don't, don't have a lot of arthritis and it doesn't seem to work. So you're right. It's, it's really hard to predict who, who's going to feel better from it. And is there any one particular joint that is most commonly affected or most commonly benefited uh, with this? Or is it just the knee that this is used for? Uh, I believe it's only FDA approved for the knee. So, and then that's the one that most of the studies have been done on and um, where most of the benefit has been seen. And are knees the most common joint affected by osteoarthritis in general? Um, you know, that's a good question. Actually, I probably would have to um, get back to you on that. But it's probably, you know, since I'm a new specialist, yes, it's one of the most common ones that I see. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it's probably one of the ones that people um, want to be seen for just because, you know, you're, it affects everything you do because you're, you're, you have to walk for, um, you know, most activities. Right. So for most activity uh, and for most people with osteoarthritis, they talk about pain being, yeah, a problem which of course limits their ability to walk and limits their ability to exercise. But we do know that people who exercise feel better. So how do you address yeah. that apparent conflict? So I think the key is low impact, no or low impact activity. And so um, it can be anything from swimming. A lot of times, you know, you know, also when you're, when you're pregnant too, the, the weight that's um, now like, buoyed by being in the water, it really helps in terms of um, keeping the weight off the knees. And so any sort of aqua aerobics, um, a lot of people with arthritis, with, with knee arthritis or hip arthritis can do comfortably. Um, sometimes riding the bike because there's not a lot of impact with that. Um, and then, you know, walking on a treadmill is, is pretty low impact, but sometimes people just have, or walking outside, um, people do have discomfort with, um, with walking. So. Yeah, so if people are having knee pain, and walking yeah. aggravates it, uh, yeah. I would think that walking would make it worse, not better. Right. So, yeah. So then you could take it down a notch and try the water aerobics or the bike um, because sometimes people can tolerate those a little better. And so now we get to the good part of this talk because, of course, uh, the best low-impact exercise uh, where you're recumbent is probably sex. So can you talk to that issue of how sex is often recommended as like a really good form of exercise for people with arthritis. Yeah, I would say, I don't actually know the studies um, with it, um, but um, I would say, yes, it definitely is, you know, as you know, all the cardiovascular benefits and stuff. The, the thing that I would actually say that I have seen in terms of issues that people have are with hip arthritis in particular, they lose motion mm -hmm. in the hips. So that actually can sometimes make intercourse difficult. Um, and then um, with the knees, a lot of times people have discomfort with actually um, kneeling on their knees. So, you know, you would probably just have to adjust things um, so that you aren't in those positions that actually aggravate the, um, those particular joints. Right. So creativity, uh, finding yeah, complications. Yeah. Uh, pillows are wonderful yeah, yeah. adjuncts. 
Um, and they even make ramps and uh, wedges and then pillows that are specifically designed uh, for that purpose. Mm -hmm. The thing I thought was most interesting about these studies is they talk about the increasing blood flow benefits and the benefit, of course, of increasing endorphins. Uh, mm -hmm. so, and I think also probably making people feel like they're still doing their normal activities and still, you know, a physically active, productive individual. Uh, okay. Yeah, the psychological benefits too, yeah. Absolutely, psychological, emotional, connectedness. Um, there was one really interesting study um, that was part of the Women's Health Initiative that was the largest study that ever looked at sexual activity in women over 50, which showed mm -hmm. the majority of women over 50 who had a partner were satisfied with their sex lives and their sexual activity. Of the ones who were not satisfied, the number one reason, of course, was not having a partner. But the no, number two issue was medical problems. Um, and of the medical problems, the number one category was depression. Number two category mm -hmm. was orthopedic uh, injuries. Mm, interesting. Now, does this ever come up in your discussions with your patients or you leave that to the gynecologist? <laughs> or the yeah, it's, and, and morally, more if it's an issue. Yeah, so I would say usually people will bring it up if it's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, definitely the the creativity part of it you're right i think that that's an important thing to highlight um but honestly it comes up more people are more concerned about it um usually after surgery in terms of what can they still do when can they do it are they are they at risk of re-injuring something mm -hmm. um so it may be that the, the people themselves don't necessarily feel comfortable bringing it up in like a, a bone doctor's um office um yeah. but then they bring it up with their you know, gyn or the boner doctor <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> we actually did a podcast interview with a woman who uh, wrote a book called Girl Boner, uh, which I highly <laughs> recommend to everyone. Uh, that was August McLaughlin. Uh, so yeah, we've covered all kinds of, uh, we've, co we've covered these topics from every angle and from every position, maybe. Um, what do you think is the most important thing you want people to know about osteoarthritis that we haven't talked about yet? I think probably that you don't need to be limited by it. It, it is a diagnosis, um, but the way to think about it is it's, it's just something that you're going to have to manage, um, and you can do that with a lot of, you know, you're not, you're not on your own with this. So your physician, a physical therapist, you know, there's a lot of people that can be involved in helping you figure out what the best plan um, of attack is. Um, and so, you know, sometimes it's as simple as just having a 10 or 15 minute um, exercises that you do in terms of sort of maintenance. Um, and sometimes it's maybe a little more in terms of you, you need to go down the injection route. Um, but it, it, it is, it, it can be managed, um, and managed effectively, um, not necessarily with, um, surgery. Yeah. So I think probably the bottom line is don't succumb to the symptoms, but manage yeah. the symptoms. Uh, I was just talking yeah. to a woman at the gym yesterday, ironically, and I brought up that we were going to be talking about this today. Uh, and she was talking about how hard it is to get to the gym and to get the exercise she needs because she's in pain. And she mm -hmm. knows intellectually that when she exercises, she feels better, but it's counterintuitive because when you're in pain, you just want to lie there and not move. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say not moving, yes, actually is worse because then you get stiff and your muscles weaken. Um, the other thing I was going to point out also is yoga and Pilates sometimes too. Um, you can you know, you may not be able to do all the like pretzel configurations um, in yoga, but you can modify the things and that can be, that can be gentle. Um, it can be gentle for joints also. Yeah, and many of these places have courses that are adapted specifically for patients with arthritis. So I know my yeah. YCA yeah. has a warm water pool and they have specific mm -hmm. water classes that are designed for people with arthritis. And as uh, I don't do yoga, uh, but I walk past the yoga studio yeah, we see them uh, advertising chair yoga uh, for people yeah. with orthopedic and balance problems. Anyway, I could talk to you all day. This has been fabulous. Uh, but where can people find you? Are you aside from uh, looking for babysitters on the Princeton listserv? Um, are you? Do you have a presence on social media? Um, I have a website, but I'm probably behind the times in terms of <laughs> um, social media things. Well, I don't think um, you find the times. I think you have no time. And certainly social media. Maybe that's the, yeah. Time sucks. Uh, but what is your website where people can find you? 
Uh, it's just on www.alexiscolvinmd.com. Awesome. Anyway, thank you so much for sharing your insights and your time and your energy and mostly your skill and expertise with our audience. I know everybody will really appreciate it. And if I get any burning questions that we didn't cover, I will send them to you. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much. This is such a pleasure. Take care. That's all we have time for today. But let's keep the conversation going on Twitter or Facebook at Dr. Dunica. And please join us next week for another episode of In the Ladies Room with Dr. Dunica. Real conversations with real women about really intimate topics.